let's get started with today's uh, talk for the festival. So I'm going to introduce a very, very special personality. His name is His Holiness Chandamuli Swami Maharaj. Please give a big round of applause. So Chandamuli Swami Maharaj is um, originally from New York and he's a disciple of um, his divine grace, Srila Prabhupada, the founder of our movement. Maharaj has been um, in the movement for decades now and he has fully dedicated himself. He's taken the renunciate celibate order of life and he has dedicated his full life to traveling around the world and actually sharing spiritual knowledge with people and how it can help them in their lives. He's a mentor, he's a guide, he's a counselor for so many people around the world and he gives lectures and personal one-to-one -one guidance to people as well on all sorts of subjects related to Krishna consciousness. So please um, do um, pay attention uh, for this talk because it's Ram Navami. Today's talk will be on Lord Ram's leadership qualities and how they relate to the modern age. So Marge will be uh, talking about this topic and Marge will give a discourse for about the first 40 minutes and then there'll be 20 minutes of Q&A and this involves all of us so it'll be interactive. We're going to have Kanchanabja Prabhu here with a mic so he's going to go around. We want you to really like um, ask questions, you know, understand and if you have any doubts or even challenges or any questions on what is being talked about in the discourse then feel free to ask about it. Okay, again one more round of applause for Chandamali Maharaj. So over to you, Maharaj. Hare Krishna. Om Gyan Timidanda Sya Gena Jena Salakaya Chaksu Un Milita Mina Tasmai Shri Gurave Namaha Nama Om Vishnu Vadaya Krishna Pristaya Bhutale Shri Makti Bhakti Vedanta Swami Tinamine Namaste Saraswati Deve Gauravani Pacharine Nirase Sasunyavari Pastyatya De Satarine Mancha Kalpa, Tarubis Cha, Kripa, Sindhu, Pe, Vacha, Pratitanam, Pavanebio, Vaishnavebio, Namaho, Namaha, Jai Sri Krishna, Chaitanya, Prabhu Nityananda, Sri Advaita Gadadar, Sivasiri Gor, Bhakta Vrinda, Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, Krishna Krishna, Hare Hare, Hare Rama, Hare Rama, Rama Rama, Hare Hare. So the qualities of Sri Ram in his position as a exemplary leader. There are many incidents that describe these qualities and how the, they are fundamental for one who is in the position of leadership. I'll just pick up some different incidents that kind of illustrate a leader, and there's so many things we can say about a leader in terms of what of the, both the qualities and the activities of a leader. But one of the most important thing is that they lead uh, those, for those that they lead, they are concerned about the welfare of those they lead. It's not leadership for the sake of position. It's not leadership for the sake of the benefits that come by that kind of position. It's leadership for the benefits of, for the benefits of the people they're leading. And I'll give you a good example in the life of Sri, Sri Ram. And this was when he was in Ayodhya. This is after the time he had come back after being in the forest for 14 years, he then took the throne and he ruled Ayodhya for another 11 years. Actually, he ruled for 11,000 years, actually. <laughs> um, there was one particular Brahmana, and he was very much devoted to Lord Ram. And he would uh, not take his food unless he actually saw the Lord. <laughs> he was so dedicated to worship of Lord 
and he made a vow that I will not eat any food until I get the darshan of the Lord. And so he followed that very strictly. But occasion came up in where the Lord had to leave for a period of time. And so he was not able to get that darshan. And the result was he fasted. In other words, when he didn't see the Lord, he would fast. And it, and it didn't matter how long it was, he would continue that fast until he would see the Lord. He was very dedicated. He, he was a loving servant of the Lord. Now this went on. After some time the Lord returned and he was informed about this Brahmana who was following this very strict and very austere vow. And uh, when the Lord heard about it, he became concerned. And so he went into his own private quarters and there was a deity of himself so the Lord took that deity and arranged for that person to have that deity. And therefore, he could worship the deity, which is non-different than the Lord. And therefore, he wouldn't have to worry about whether the Lord was personally present or not. Because we understand that the deity is the manifestation of the Supreme Personality of God. In. It's non-different according to Scripture and according to the principle of worship. And so, in order for him to become happy, satisfied, and not have to go through great austerities, the Lord personally gifted him this particular deity, and that way he wouldn't have to fast. So here's an example of how the Lord was concerned about the individual life of a person. So you see, and this is one small example, there are many, that... Uh, a leader has to be concerned about the quality of what's his, what his followers are exemplifying. In other words, giving out. So he's concerned. He, nowadays, we see in modern societies, people don't even know who they lead. <laughs> and they get into a particular position, and may, it becomes quite impersonal. And it's more about the position than about the uh, concern for those that they lead. Um, there's one particular characteristics that we mention. We understand from the spiritual perspective that each and every one of us is a servant. Jivir, Surubai, Krishna, and Nityadas. It's explained that every living entity is eternally a servant of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. And so to serve is our constitutional position, it's our nature. So whether we're serving in the material world, in relationship to family or occupation or to social obligations, we're serving. And in the spiritual realm, we understand that that principle is a high principle to somehow or other take the position of service of course, we may accept service in order to give service, but the goal is to give service. And so we coin a particular phrase, servant leadership. One who is in a position of leadership serves from that position. I remember I met one very interesting person. He was a, uh, a senator in one state in America, Michigan, there was. And he had read uh, Bhakti Tirta Swami's book on servant leadership. Uh, this was after the disappearance of Maharaj and he came there to honor Maharaj in our ceremony re in remembrance of Maharaj. And he spoke and he was quite incredulous. He said, I never even conceived of the idea that a leader is a servant. But he was, he was attracted by the whole idea and he was also convinced that this is the concept, what it means is that whatever position you have, no matter what, you're a servant. <laughs> a mother serves the family, her children, she serves the husband, the husband serves the family. Go to work, you serve the boss. 
when people are in relationships to each other, they think how to serve each other in order to build the quality of that relationship. So service we can't get away from, it's our nature. And so when, when it's not there in the mood of a leader, it becomes, that leader becomes, what we say, a misleader, no longer can, can actually lead. But it's not about serving uh, something that is not personal. In other words, people serve in order to get a position. People serve in order to get the benefits of their position, such as wealth or some kind of a claim or some, some something about their own uh, interests. But a leader serves for the benefit of those who are serving. And that is the quality. So they have to know about the, who they're serving. When King Yudhisthira took the throne after the Battle of Kurukshetra, he uh, immediately set up a policy that anyone in the kingdom could give, come and see him and speak to him. If they had personal problems or had some concern or just wanted to meet him, he, his door was open. And he made that his main uh, activity as a leader. And so many people came to see and they came with different problems, they came with different ideas. And so, there's an example of how a leader leads. They, want, they don't just have an impersonal understanding, they get to know each and every person they're serving. <laughs> so that way they can, qualify, they can put quality in their service, they can know the individual. And Ram was like that. He, uh, he had a very personal and in a very intimate relationship with each and every person that he came in contact with. And by doing that, people would like to serve a leader like that because that brings out that quality of service when the leader is concerned about the person and they can feel that concern. Nowadays, people don't care about who, there's, who the leader is. In fact, they don't even take part in the in the process of election of a leader because they think it's all the same. Whoever's gonna be in there, he's gonna, make, he's gonna do the same thing that the other guy did. And uh, so people are not so much interested in getting involved with the process of making leadership because they know that it's, you know, no one, everyone is interested in their own political position or social position or whatever position they may have as a leader. But that's not leadership. One of the qualities that is important of a leader, a leader can't be one-sided. He has to be strong when it's necessary and has to be soft when it's necessary. In other words, if a, a leader is always harsh or strong or rules with an iron hand, then that's a, not a balance and that won't, that won't uh, take care of the business that's needed. We see in the example of Lord Ramachandra, what did he do? When he felt that his wife, Sita Devi, had someone somehow breached her chastity, she didn't, but he, when she came back, at the end, at the end of the battle of Kurukshetra, uh, I'm sorry, at the end of the battle of Lanka, <laughs> getting the different battles <laughs> mixed up here. At the end of the battle of Lanka, you know, she had been chased. She had been in the, under the custody of Ram, Ravana for 11 months, but she remained faithful. And she didn't even look at Ravana, what to speak of, you know, uh, listening to any of the things that he wanted her to do. It was perfect. But Ram didn't accept her back. She had prepared herself. She came to meet her husband after of being away from him for 11 months. It was an excitement for her. She was wanted to be at her best. She came in a very sweet and loving mood and well, in, uh, eager again to be in the association of Ram. But all he said was to her was, you're unchaste. <laughs> you have been with another person for so many months, therefore I cannot accept you back. Of course, she proved 
that he was wrong, but what he was doing, he was testing her. Because he, he would have been criticized for accepting her back without her going through that. And as soon as a leader gets criticized, then that leads to other people, you know, believing that criticism, and then there's a taint. So a leader has to be beyond reproach. There has to be no faults in the leader. <laughs> Where do you see that today? <laughs> because people don't know what it means to be a leader. They don't understand that it's not something about power, position, or intelligence, or ability. It's character. The character it makes up the quality of a person, and one has to lead by the proper character. In spiritual life, it's spiritual character. In material life, it's honesty or morality, the principles that govern civility. But we, in talking in terms of uh, Sri Ram, he was ideal in his character. We have the example when he was uh, asked to take the throne after so many years that his father, now Dasarat, he wanted to retire from the leadership in Ayodhya. He was the king, he had been there for so many decades. He was an ideal leader. He wanted a time. He wanted to retire timely. He was also beyond reproach. And now he had designated out of the four sons, Bart, Satrugna, Lakshman, and Ram, he had chosen Ram because Ram was the son of his senior queen, Koshalya. And so he felt that he should be, and he had all the qualities, even as a young boy. And so when he was asked, he immediately agreed. And it was obviously the right choice, but still he agreed to follow the instruction or the direction of his father and take the throne. But then we know what happened later on is that when Kaikei had come with this plan to make Bart the king, her son, and banish Ram to the forest, she approached her husband, Dasara. Now, Dasara had given her a boon or a, a, a benediction that you could ask from me anything you want, two boons, two benedictions, and I will immediately fulfill your desire. She had saved his life on the battlefield and now he became indebted to her and he wanted to reciprocate, so he gave her that boon. Now, he didn't know when she asked him what he was going to, and she was going to ask, he didn't realize it was something that was completely, <laughs> you might say, contrary to everyone's desire that make Bart the king and send Ram to the forest. That's a long story. But she approached him and said, this is what I want. First she said, you remember, you had given me this benediction that any time I asked, and I said I would take it at the time when I felt it was needed. Now is the time. And so she asked. When, when Dasarat heard that, he was, just, was like he was struck by a thunderbolt. His mind, she, first of all, he couldn't believe what she was saying. She was so dedicated. She was such a chaste and faithful wife. And she loved Ram. But being influenced by her maidservant, who had somehow or other, in a very crafty and a very, very cunning way, was able to change her mind in a different way, she, uh, she went against Ram. And she went against everyone's desire. And now she used her desire in a way that it, could have, it couldn't be refused because Dasarat, being a king, being a Kshatriya, he gave his word. So she forced him, she said, you have given your word. Therefore, as a leader, as a king, 
as a, as a person who is devoted to truth, how can you refuse? You'll be criticized. And he understood, yes, that I have given my word, but his word was contrary to everyone's best interest, apparently. And he reluctantly gave her the benediction she wanted. When Ram heard that, that now he was not going to be the king, which was the next day, it was a big ceremony for his coronation, it was all in line, the entire citizens, all the citizens of Ayodhya were so ready, they were so happy. Now, Ram will be the new prince regent and the, the glory of, of uh, Ayodhya will continue to increase. That's how they felt. But when Ram was requested, reluctantly, by his father, that now there's a change, I have given this promise to your stepmother, Kaikei, Bart will be the king, Ram said, fine. <laughs> and you have to go to the forest for 14 years. That was the hard part. Being, accepting Bart as the king was easy. No, because Ram didn't have any, any, what we say, personal interest in taking the throne. He did it as a service for everyone and at the request of his father. But now everything changed. So what happened? Now he's supposed to go to the forest and immediately, and, and as, it, as you read in the, in the text, he said, my dear father, if this is your desire, this is also my desire. Obedience, <laughs> no personal interest. Uh, seeing his superiors as his guide. So Ram wasn't in a position of leadership at that time, but we know that he had all re leadership qualities even at that particular time. So using that quality, what did he do? He simply accepted something that was difficult because it was wanted by his, his superiors. And one of the qualities of a leader is they don't act independently. They always take advice from others. We were mentioning earlier how there are three types of leaders. One, the first class leader is one who makes a decision or calculates a particular plan that they want to execute, then goes to his ministers, to his advisors, and presents his ideas. We have the example when Dasarat wanted to perform the Asvamedha Yagya in order to give auspiciousness to the kingdom because he was feeling unhappy that he didn't have a son. This is before the, the appearance of Ram. He went to his ministers and said, this is what I want to do, what do you think? His minister said, very good. This is wonderful. They agreed, but he, he didn't act independently. So that is considered a leader who is in the first class consciousness of leadership. They get advice, although they make the decision they uh, acknowledge that decision or get the blessings of that decision, get the permission of that decision from others. The second class leader is one who makes a decision, goes to his advisors, his ministers, and see if they agree with him. And if they don't agree with him, he does what he wants anyway. <laughs> That's Ravana. Ravana was like that. He would ask advice, but he always wanted advice to support what he already felt was the right thing. <laughs> Another type of leader. You know, uh, sometimes you talk to people, isn't that correct? Isn't that correct? Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're already encouraging him to agree with you before you, you know, actually explain everything. 
So yeah, people want to agree without getting proper advice or counseling. And the last class leader, the third class leader, you might say, doesn't consult everybody. Anyone just does what they want. <laughs> so Ram was, you see, when Ram was in the forest, he would took advice from Augusta Muni on how to live into the forest. He's the supreme personality of Godhead. But he's teaching by example. He takes advice from the Brahminical class. We understand according to the Van Ashram system, which is the foundation for activities in human society, that the leaders, the Kshatriyas, they are called the leaders in society, they take advice from the Brahminical class. And the Brahminical class just gives advice and uh, that's all. They don't perform, they don't take any position. Their whole idea, their whole service is to advise the leaders, both in spiritual principles and in practical managerial principles also. So Augusta Muni was there <clears throat> and he was giving various types of instructions to Ram. Augusta Muni is one of the more powerful Munis. And at one point, Augusta Muni came forth with this arrow. It was a powerful arrow. He said to Ram, because the great souls, they're trikala gyan. They know past, present, and future. So these great sages, they can also see the future. So he said to Ram, here, this arrow is like a nuclear weapon, <laughs> to use in a modern day analogy. He said, when you need it the most, use it. Only when you need it at the most dire time. Fast forward a little, the battle between Ravana and uh, Ram at the end. When Ram and Ravana were fighting each other and it was a one-to-one -one battle, Everyone else stopped in the battlefield to watch. And it was a tremendous battle. I mean, Ravana was expert at fighting and he was fighting to his capacity and he was also using his mystic power to fly in the sky, to disappear, to appear in different places at the same time. And the battle was going on. Now, Ravana had 10 heads. And so Ram was thinking, you know, I'm going to kill him by cutting off his head. So every time he shot an arrow, he would cut off the head, one of the heads of Ravana, and the head grew back. Ravana was blessed with this elixir of immortality that any time a head was cut off, he had this special, I don't know what do you call it, uh, it was some kind of it was like an elixir of immortality and another head would grow back. So Ram was thinking, what's going on? He was cutting off his heads and the head was growing back. So it appears that Ram doesn't know what he's doing, right? <laughs> or he's acting according to a, the human calculation of a situation. He's calculating it that way. So then Vibhishan comes over and says, that's not the way to do it, Ram. You have to hit him, you have to shoot for the heart. <laughs> he said that's because in that heart he has a pool of unlimited nectar which is feeding his life. If you dry up that nectar, that's the only way you can kill him. So Ra Ram remembered, oh yes, I have that special arrow and this is the time to use it. So he took that arrow and and he shot that arrow and it went right into the heart of Ravana. It went through it, it went into the earth, went around the earth seven times and came back into the quiver of Ram. That arrow was given to him by Augusta Muni. Augusta Muni is a sadhu. So here's the, here's the, the message. Take advice from saintly persons, even in practical matters. Because saintly persons can see 
what is the need, what is the vision, and how to lead your life in that way. So taking advice from saintly persons is the, one of the main businesses, especially for those, this is a general principle, but especially for those who are in leadership positions. Even those who are in leadership positions take advice from other leaders because it always helps to broaden the scope of choice. It helps to understand things clearly. And it also helps one to be accountable. One of the, one of the important things that a leader must do is take association from peers. Sometimes we find, and this is quite common, you find leaders who are surrounded mostly by followers. And of course, followers come and leaders accept and they also, that is their service. But it's necessary in order to keep proper understanding of what it means to be a leader to associate with those in the same business, you might say. In other words, associate with peer groups. Because in the peer groups, then you can reflect, you can learn, you can also get rid of things, they can help you get rid of the things that you don't need in your service as a leadership, whether it's an internal quality or it's an activity that you're performing. So it's important that leaders take association from others of the same uh, level of leadership. It's very important. We call it sadhu sangha, but it's more than that. It's actually a cha cha uh, an opportunity to stay fixed in the proper way in one's service as a leader. These are some of the qualities. Another quality, and we might say this, is, this bridges the, the area of material. A leader is a reader. <laughs> A leader is a reader. They are an avid reader. They read, read, read. Because they have to have knowledge, both of leadership and developing a vision by which they can lead. One of the qualities of a leader is to have a vision. We see that even in today's world, the today's leaders, they give you a vision of what the future will be, but the problem is, they never were able to fulfill the vision. They, things, they say, things will get better, just follow me. And people follow, but things don't get better. <laughs> Sometimes they get a little better. Why, what's the problem with today's leadership? Because people are not educated or qualified to take the position of leadership. What is the qualification? It's character, it's ability, it's not simply some kind of education that comes from secularism or some kind of graduation from prestigious schools. That's not the qualification. Because we see, you know, Ravana, Ravana was a leader. And he knew the scriptures well. I mean, his father was Vishrava. He was a Brahmin. His mother was a very nice lady, but Somehow or other, she became polluted by a demon. A demon had accosted her, and Ravana was born. And uh, so he, his mother, you know, it says that the son takes on the qualities of the mother, and the daughter takes on the qualities of the father. That's the general tendency. So Ravana had the, had the qualities of his mother, but he had the knowledge of his father. His father was a great Brahmin, and he knew the scriptures well. But he twisted the scriptures to fit his own selfish interests. And therefore, his leadership was a disaster to both himself, those he was leading, and everyone else. Because he was leading simply from the position of getting more and more opportunities for sense gratification and material facilities. And that's what today's leaders teach. What do they teach you? You know, it'll get better materially. But they don't talk about characters like Prabhupada used to say, 
The business of a president or a king or a monarch is to make sure each and every citizen is following some path of religious, uh, some path of religion. In other words, they have to be, in other words, religion or spirituality is the innate quality of the living being because we understand that we are spiritual beings. And so just to live a secular life means to live a shadow life that has no real value. Unless one comes to spiritual life, they haven't understood what is the value of life and how to become happy. So Prabhupada says that it's a business of a, one who is in position of power to make sure each and every citizen that they're leading is following some path of religion. It may be the one path, maybe another path, maybe another path, it doesn't matter. They have to be following that path and according to how that path teaches. Interesting, it's quite interesting. You wouldn't think that that would be a responsibility of a leader, but it is because the goal of life, as explained in the Shastras, is to become God conscious. That's the goal of life. Whatever is done in the material world has, supports that principle and it's also required. But the ultimate goal is to fulfill our, our obligation to the Supreme Lord by worshiping the Lord and bringing out that character and quality that is conducive to worshiping the Lord. And that's what it means to be a leader or a follower even. And also, we also might mention that in order to be a good follower, a leader, you have to be a good follower. <laughs> A leader doesn't become independent, they have to follow also. We have, just like we have in our disciplic succession, you have a series of spiritual teachers, one after the other, which is giving knowledge, coming down ultimately from Krishna himself. It's like in our, we are the Brahma, Gaudiya, Madhva, Sampradaya. Sampradaya means disciplic succession of saintly persons who are qualified to teach and to preach spiritual knowledge. So everyone is following. We saw we saw an example of Srila Prabhupada, the ideal leader, when he was giving, uh, you know, what's the word? He was given praise and glorification for whatever he did. He said, it's not me. It's simply I followed my spiritual master. So a leader also gives credit to those that they learn from as their own success in life. And not thinking, well, I have so many good qualities, just see what I can do. This pride you know, which comes with position. And you'll see that. Position has a tendency to bring pride. And when it's there in leadership, it ruins everything because a leader will affect the lives of so many people. And if they become proud, they become bewildered, they become confused, and they can't lead properly from the position of being proud. We see sometimes Indra, the king of heaven, he's the king of heaven, he is the king of the devas, he works under only, he only works under Lord Brahma himself. He has 33 million devotee gods under his control. And he somehow becomes proud of his position and does the wrong thing. <laughs> gets in trouble. He did it many times. He didn't recognize Krishna. He tried to kill Krishna's re residence of Vrindavan by, we all know the Govardhan Puja where he was just pouring rainfall. Because his position was somewhat challenged by Krishna, but he didn't recognize Krishna. And he thought, well, who is he to challenge? Lord Brahma didn't even recognize Krishna. He tried to steal his calves and cow, cow herd. Voice. <laughs> so uh, there's a tendency for leadership to somehow become a little bit uh, enamored by their position. But one of the qualities of a leader is they have to become humble. <laughs> Humility means to give credit to whatever you do 
to those that you have learned from, those who you are working with. In other words, they don't take credit. They just say, it is because of others that I'm able to do what I'm doing. And that we understand that. And for a leader, especially in spiritual life, they get all credit to the Lord, or they give all credit to their spiritual master. So we could speak a little bit about today's leadership in the secular world, but I think we find that there are so many uh, anomalies, so many deficiencies. And if you study a little bit of the politics, I mean, maybe some of you are in tune in that level, you see how they give policy according to vested interests. It's not about the benefit of the people. It's about the vested interests of various types of powerful organizations. So we're in a very difficult situation in the world today because the leadership around the world don't represent people. Mm -hmm. That's also mentioned in the Mahabharat, where the le there's a nice story in the Mahabharat. It's an analogy. Uh, we mentioned how Yudhisthira had opened up his uh, his door to anyone and everyone. So one time, one person came to see Yudhisthira, and he presented his problem. He said, my dear Yudhisthira, I made a garden, beautiful garden, and I got so many nice flowers and shrubs and trees cultivated the garden nicely, and after I was done, I was so happy. It had everything, and it was nicely done. And then I was thinking, hmm, I have to do something to protect the garden from being destroyed. So I built a wall around the garland. And then the most strangest thing happened the wall started to encroach on the garden and started to destroy the garden. I built a wall to protect the garden and now the wall is destroying the garden. Give me an answer. Why is it happening? This is in the Mahabharata. Yudhisthira is very clear. He understood that this is the age of Kali and Krishna has disappeared from the planet and things will start to go down. So he said, what this represents is that the citizens will elect their leaders for protection, for guidance, and the leaders will destroy the citizens. <laughs> this is the age of Kali. And you'll see that it's only getting worse. So, I mean, sometimes we see a leader has some good intentions, but they can't do much. Prabhupada, would, someone asked Prabhupada, should we try to get some of our devotees in power and then maybe we can change the face of how things go in the world towards spiritual harmony? Prabhupada thought about that early and then we also had in, in God We Trust Party where we were trying to elect one devotee. But Prabhupada stopped it after a while. And he responded later by saying, even if they get in, they can't do anything. <laughs> Even if there's a good person get in, the system is so corrupt that you will not be able to do anything. <laughs> and you'll see, if someone is too good, they don't last. <laughs> so this is today's society. So we talk about Ram Raj, right? <laughs> the rule of Ram. But we want Ram Raj, but we have to bring in Ram. And what does that mean to bring in Ram? To understand, Ram lived by character. He lived by values, he, both spiritual values and moral values. He taught, and one of the most important principles is integrity. Integrity, well, we have an example of what integrity is. Let's see. I think I wrote it down here. Integrity is the principle by which one acts in all relationships, and it's fueled by progress. By, by acting in an in, 
out of integrity, one mo makes progress. And when progress is there, integrity gets supported. But integrity is honesty. Integrity is accountability. Integrity also helps to facilitate one's activities in the position of leadership. Otherwise, if there's no integrity, there's no, uh, we, we also call that, um, uh, what is that word? Uh, transparency. A leader has to be transparent. What you see is what you get. It's not like, well, when I'm out in the public, I'm one way, and then when I'm somewhere else, in more private life, then it doesn't matter. I do whatever I want in my life. But character isn't the most important thing in any leadership position. If a person's not, their character is not good, what can you expect from that type of leadership? So transparency allows for that character to be, you know, to be evaluated and altered if it's needed. As you don't find that, there's the personal life and the private life. There's a little antidote, it's kind of funny. Prabhupada said uh, the word teacher, T-E-A-C-H-E-R, uh, teacher is, but nowadays you take the same letters, T-E-A-C-H-E-R, and you change it around, C-H-E-A-T-E-R. You get a different word. Cheater. <laughs> but if you're good at cheating, hey, that's good leadership. <laughs> If I can fool people, and if I can somehow or other fulfill my desires, and if I, it doesn't matter what I say, it's the goal that counts. <laughs> no, <laughs> no. One cannot use ill means to attain a particular goal because that's another form of cheating. And that person has no qualities of a leader. <laughs> so let me see here. There's one, one particular point, yeah. Yeah, this is, illustrates what I said. This is from the Ramayana. Even the most powerful monarch becomes weak and pitiable under the influence of lust. Even the most powerful monarch becomes weak and pitiable, people feel sorry for him, under the influence of lust. So their character has to be good. Their private life should not be something different than at least the principles of morality. Mm -hmm. A leader is centered on accountability and not on privacy. A leader is accountable for his privacy. Mm -hmm. So these are some of the qualities of leadership. And there's many, many more that we can speak about um, when Vibhishan wanted to join Ram, he came, and you can see, and there's a picture that describes what is happening. He's coming to join Ram, and now the monkeys are with Ram. They're all there. They're suspicious. Here is a Rakshastra. He's the brother of Ravana. Now he's coming. He's probably a spy. So we shouldn't trust him. So they were giving advice in that way. But Ram could see differently. He understood Vibhishan was of a different character. Although he was of the same parent, the same family, he uh, wasn't of the same mold, you could say. Because actually Vibhishan was born of a different mother and they had the same father. That's why, that's why Vibhishan was a stepbrother of actually Ravana. And he was saintly in character, and somehow he wound up in the family of Rakshashas. And he never liked what his brother was doing, and he was always giving him advice. But, but, but you know, Ravana would always accuse him of being, you know, the servant of his enemy. But because he was his brother, he, he, didn't, he didn't do anything harmful to him, but he criticized him a lot. So now he's tired and he wants to join, you know, Ram.
But Ram welcomed him and could see that this person is actually sincere and they want to come and, and on the side of righteousness, on the side of morality, on the side of spirituality. So Ram could see this. So a leader has to have a vision, be able to understand things, not simply from books, but by their own experience, by their own qualities. You would see that in the life of Srila Prabhupada, those of you who had any personal association with Prabhupada. Prabhupada knew you. He never met you, but he knew you. <laughs> he knew you in the sense that he understand, he could understand something about you, and it wasn't in a judgmental way, it was in a way to, what can I do to bring this person closer to Krishna consciousness? He could see right through you. And if he saw something that was unpleasant, he pushed it aside as something that was needed to be removed. But that was Srila Prabhupada. He had that vision when he was with his disciples, and the disciples could understand that also. He knows me. <laughs> I mean, that was deep. <laughs> That's really deep. Prabhupada, Prabhupada's intelligence and his spiritual acumen was so... I mean, Prabhupada was just a special person. He came from the spiritual world to do this work by spreading Krishna consciousness. So uh, he knew past, present, and future, and he knew his disciples also. And so with this, a leader should have some insight on what is the need of the disciples, what is the character of their disciples or followers like that. Just like a, a parent has to take care of their children, so they get to, they know their children and they know what their children needs and how, what they, how, what, what will take them to grow in the right way. If the parent doesn't know the child, how can he lead the child? Well, that's natural because that's in the family and it gets to be known automatically by that, by that association. But a leader also has to have that, otherwise their leadership falls short of perfection. So if we study the life of Ram, and we see how he led, and how he kept his word, how he was obedient to superiors, how he was humble in the, in the presence of great personalities, such as great sages and others, he exhibited all good qualities. And you might say, we use a little statement, if a person is rich, if a person is powerful, if a person ha has maybe even followers, if he's not kind, who cares? <laughs> who cares? That kindness is actually the most important quality of a leader. They lead for the benefit of others and they understand what is, that, the, uh, what is actually beneficial for others. So that, that's one of the most important and the most prominent qualities of a leader. They're kind by nature. <laughs> okay, I'll stop there. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Maybe we can give a round of applause. Thank you. So um, we've got 10 minutes. So I think what we'll do is um, we can actually hand it over straight to on the floor, Q&A. Um, I can also ask any questions, but maybe we can hand it to the floor. Is there any questions for Marge based on the discourse that Marge has just given? You can put your hands up, and we have Kanchanamja who will obviously come around with the mic. Oh, the, the, the mic is there. Any questions from the floor? Okay, maybe I can start off then. Um, oh, there's a question there. Oh, there is a question. Yeah. No, no, there isn't. No, there isn't. That's just come to Oh, me. okay. Okay. So, <clears throat> thank you, Marge, for you uh, highlighted a lot of interesting things there. Um, you mentioned that, you know, the values that Lord Ram was displaying, like, for example, you know, Bharat offered to give the kingdom back to Lord Ram because it was unjustly given to him. 
And Lord Ram didn't take it. He said, no, no, you look after the kingdom. I, I have to go to the forest. Even though it was, the whole thing was unjust against him, um, you know, based on KK's unreasonable He did demands. that because that was, the, that was the command of his father. Yeah. Yeah, he wanted to obey his, he couldn't go back on his father's request. Yeah. So, okay, so he obeyed his father's request. Um, in this day and age, it's sometimes seen that a leader should be affirmative, should be assertive. Would you say that that kind of decision would be um, acceptable or should be actually needed for the sort of society we're dealing with now? Assertiveness is another quality, but it has to be used according to time, place, and candidate circumstance. It's not that you you characterize assertiveness and then you use that all the time. No, you have to be assertive at some times. Uh, just like Prabhupada would say, Lord Chaitanya, he's he's strong as a thunderbolt, but he's soft as a rose. So he would use those qualities accordingly, whatever situation was needed. So a leader is not one-sided. <laughs> he can be strong and he can be a very assertive, but then only when that warrants that. And he needs to have that intelligence to discriminate between when to use it and when not to use it. But it's done as a service. It's not done simply as a char characteristical trait. It's done to get the job done. Mm. <laughs> mm. So in, in that respect, because Bharat taking the kingdom, he would have done a good role in leading whilst Lord Ram was away, so. He felt, yeah, he felt Bar, Bart could do it, but Bart, Bart didn't want it. Hmm. He led from a, he led from a distance. He didn't even go into Ayodhya. He led from Nandigram, which was a little place nearby. Because <laughs> he felt Ram was the real king. But he acted in the position of giving advice and making policy, but he did everything on behalf of Ram. That was his consciousness. Thank you, Maharaj. Also, regarding his handling um, of Sita Devi at the end of the war, after everything's settled, you mentioned how Lord Ram had to put Sita Devi through that test of Chastian. I know this is a topic that often comes up, right? Is one can argue maybe was that does that a little bit harsh, like you Most know, like harsh, yeah. to you know, like to like to just to prove that she's beyond reproach, mm -hmm. to make her go through that ordeal. How does one justify that in the modern context? Well, that harshness was necessary in order to, you know, keep away any criticism that would have come by way of not making it known that Sita was actually pure. He had to show her chastity to the world, otherwise he would have been criticized for taking her back. Mm -hmm. And that happened later on. One, you know, that washerman, he criticized her to, because his wife, his wife went out all night and she was somewhere else and she came back the next morning and then he chastised her for doing that and he said, I am not like Ram. And he didn't, he somehow wasn't aware that Sita had already proved her chastity. So, not knowing, he criticized his wife by using Ram, the, uh, Ram as an example. <laughs> I'm not like him. Mm. Thank you, Maharaj. Um, but that was wrong. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That was wrong, obviously. Yeah. You know, you mentioned about um, leadership and how it's about making decisions. You mentioned also Prabhupada also was obviously a very good leader for modern day. There are certain times when a leader has to pick their fights and certain times when they have to just let go and realize that not all fights are worth fighting. When we look at Prabhupada's life, when it came to the Juhu property, he stuck with that. You know, no matter all the obstacles that are coming against him, he stuck with the Juhu property. Why? 
I was going to ask you that, why did he stick with that? And then if you compare to Jhansi, which is earlier on, he let that one go. So yeah, what, what? There was one factor that, that, and Prabhupada said, because I have done this, you know, I'm determined to get this property. And it was just one thing. When he first got the property, he, after he installed the deities, he came in a very humble and a very reverential way. He said, my dear Lord, I will build you a temple on this place. He said, I made a promise to Shishi Radha Rasa Bihari, I would build him a temple. That's why. And Prabhupada said, I would have, I would have gave, I, I, I would have, we could have had any other property, but I had already put the deities there and I promised them that I would build them a temple. So that was the, that was the motivation why Prabhupada stuck to the whole thing. Mm. Yeah, he even said that. He said, I, you know, we could have just let it go, but I had promised the Lord. How how would we in our everyday life now make a call then between? Because you know we may not make vows for every single decision we make, but still we have decisions where okay, do we follow this through and fight it, or do we let go of it? Especially for those who are involved in management of some sort or another. That takes intelligence. Mm. You have to see the situation and see what is the possible outcome. What are the liabilities? Should we go ahead with it? Is there an alternative to fulfilling our desires in another way? It takes some intelligence, some discrimination. Probably it also takes some advice coming from others. You know, just like I know there's one temple being built in America. And there's so much controversy on how the temple should go. How big we should make it, how small we should make it, what deities we should do. So it's going back and forth. It's been going on for years. And they can't come to an agreement. But they're working it out, and gradually, gradually, some of the, you know, the contentions are falling away. Because their vision is that this is their goal. So somehow they're, uh, they have to uh, work out all of these disagreements. And these are all leaders disagreeing with each other on the direction. Unfortunately, there's not one leader who can finalize the decision. That's what happens when you have a board of directors that do managing. <laughs> you don't get anything done. <laughs> you might get something done. <laughs> but Prabhupada always said the system is you have to have one leader, ultimately, that when decisions get stuck or ideas cannot you know, generate to fulfill the, the plan, he has to say, well, this is the way it goes. <laughs> and we should do it like that. When Prabhupada was here, that's what he did. And everyone accepted Prabhupada. So when Prabhupada said that, we had no problem. And when Prabhupada was gone, he put so many persons to be his representatives to lead in different ways around the world. And so then you saw so many other ideas came up. <laughs> So you need that. Mm. You have to have that one, uh, you know. Every, every successful operation has a qualified leader. <laughs> Maharaj, you mentioned um, that all leaders, or leaders should um, take advice from the saintly personalities, um, you know, when they conduct their operations. When one looks at history, um, if, I mean, religious conflicts in history or even like secular conflicts like, like the Tsars of Russia were taking advice from this holy man called Rasputin. You've got the, the religious, you know, the invasions that have been done in the name of religion like the Crusades in South America or the invasions, the Islamic invasions or what have you. All the it, violence that's been caused, there's always, they always will put up a religious person or a scripture saying no the books have ordained us to do this and then they obviously then it comes out a disaster and people lose faith so how do we detect spot the right saintly person to take advice from 
in this day and age because there's a lot of cynicism around taking advice from spiritual people to guide you know the lives of society well <clears throat> a leader is understood by his qualities his characters and his ability to lead so when you see that and then you can say oh this person is the person to take advice from in other words it doesn't happen automatically it takes some time to develop that faith and understand who is that person who has the qualities and Prabhupada first started the movement he had all the qualities but he got challenged a lot but he was able to accept the challenges and show by his example and by his uh, activities that he was qualified to do what he was saying what he wanted to do but one of the qualities that we saw in Prabhupada he was kind very kind and he would go out of his way to show kindness to others you know you have you might have say a person who is a leader but doesn't have time for the little guy because they're making big programs projects to make things happen but they don't talk to or don't have a relation Prabhupada wasn't like that Prabhupada had a relationship with each and every devotee <laughs> and therefore he won their hearts <laughs> they trusted him thank you yeah. um, I can ask more questions but before I do is there any um, yeah Dipesh Prabhu Hare Krishna Maharaj, uh, please accept my humble obeisance. He's all glorious to Srila Prabhupada. Hare Krishna. Maharaj, I have one question. Um, when we read the Ramayan, we see when uh, Sita Devi was uh, uh, taken away by Ravana, uh, Lord Ramachandra was really in a deep state of misery, anguish. Also, we find description where he was crying and he was he almost lost composure. So, what was Lord Ramachandra trying to teach through that uh, emotions that he went through uh, for us? And how does it relate to a leader? <laughs> <laughs> he was talking, a husband is lost without his wife. <laughs> I'm a husband and my wife's gone. How can I be a husband without a wife? <laughs> So he's lamenting from the loss of his wife. Yeah. Kind of. Yeah. He was actually chanting her names. In four months during the rainy season, he went to a cave. You can see that cave. We went there. There's a deity of uh, Ram, and he's got his hand on his heart, and he's got one hand on the Japa beads, one hand on his heart. He's lamenting for the loss of his wife. Mm -hmm. Can we do that? <laughs> That's love. <laughs> That's responsibility also. She's a faithful wife. Uh, somehow or other, uh, I didn't give her the protection. He was feeling somewhat responsible that she was gone. Although he tried to protect her by giving Lakshman the duty of protecting her when she was gone but she she acted in such a way that Lakshman could no longer stay with her because she was criticizing him unfairly and he just being a Kshatriya was just burning his mind to hear her criticism and what she was saying was completely wrong <laughs> She was accusing him of wanting to be with her in the absence of Ram. And of course that wasn't Lakshman at all. He was he would always look at her feet. He wouldn't even look at her above her feet. He was worshipping her and he was also serving her and Ram all the time. But she became bewildered. So she fell into this principle of illusion. She could not so you might say was that yoga maya she was put in that illusion in order to allow for this 
pastime to unfold. You could say that. But then again, then you see, she wanted that deer. So that was a material desire. She wanted the deer and she forced Ram to, you know, fulfill that desire, being a, a good husband and wanting to please his wife. He tried. But the deer was obviously a, a demon in disguise. So she, it seems like she started to exhibit a material desire. I want this deer and I must have it. So there we can learn that, you know, wrong desire can lead to something unpleasant. And the unpleasantry was she was kidnapped, you know, by Ravana. So you might say that, yeah, Ram was for feeling somewhat responsible and she was no longer there. So he was lamenting both the loss and he was also thinking, you know, I didn't give her the protection. Because it says the duty, it's the duty of a husband to give full protection to his wife in all capacity, emotional, and spiritual, everything. That's Shastra and that's, that is also the principles of morality. <laughs> Thank you, Maharaj. Is that okay? Yes. Okay. Any other questions from anyone in the audience? Yes. yes, we have Probably. a question there. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna, uh, Maharaj. But I have a question about uh, Dashat Maharaj. When Kekaya. Dashrat Maharaj. Dashrat, okay. When Kekaya uh, asked for the fulfillment of those two boons. Uh, Kekaya, that you should send Ram away and uh, Bar should be the king. So that's the two boons I want. So instead of straight away acting on those uh, on those two boons, why uh, why Dashat Maharaj didn't consult uh, his uh, ministers like uh, Vashisht Muni before straight away sending Ram away? He, he could have consulted. Uh, why did she ask for those kinds of boons? No, no, no I'm asking that uh, uh, that instead of Just acting speak on... A, speak a little slower and then I can catch it because these microphones, they throw the sound upward, you know, sometimes. Yeah. Yes, sir. I'm asking Maharaj, like Dashat Maharaj, instead of straight away acting on the request of his wife, he could have consulted his ministers like Vachishta Muni before sending Ram away that, that Kekaya, yeah, my wife has oh. asked for those two boons, so what should I do? He oh, says, you mean he failed to get consultation, he just accepted the fact that she asked for the boons. Well, he promised her. <laughs> and, you know, as a Kshatriya, he wasn't going to ba go back on his promise. And she also, she used that. You, you know, you're, you're, you give your promise, now you're going back on your word. When you say that to a person who is actually a Kshatriya, it's like, it's an insult. It's a great insult. And they will keep their word no matter what. That's, their, that's one of the qualities of a, a real Kshatriya. Whatever they say, even at the expense of their own inconvenience, they will keep their word, you know. Yeah. So Dasarat, there wasn't no, any question of taking advice. He, he gave his word and now he had to follow it. <laughs> what do you think the ministers would have said? I mean, we can speculate. They would have said, well, <laughs> you know, do what you think is right. <laughs> I guess that would have probably be some of the possible responses they would have said. But um, you might also say that he was so overwhelmed with the fact of what she had, he failed to even think about asking advice. <laughs> and when he told everyone, they didn't agree, but they understood that this was his promise. 
is just like when uh, Dasarat, when Vishwamitra Muni came to see Dasarat, and those two demons, Maricha and Subaha, were desecrating the sacrifice of the Brahmanas, Vishwamitra Muni came to Dasarat to get Ram so Ram could finish these demons. And when Vishwamitra Muni, he was a Brahmana, and Dasarat welcomed him and he said, you know, you're my guest, you know, what can we do for you? In other words, whatever you ask, it's there. <laughs> and so when he asked, he's give me your son, he didn't want to do it. <laughs> he said, he's just a young boy, I'll go in his place. No, no, <laughs> I want Ram. <laughs> Vishwamitra Muni was not going to change. And Dasarat had given his word that just request and I will fulfill your request. So what could he do? He agreed reluctantly. Here was a Brahmin and you know he actually asked Vishishta and Vishishta says you don't want to get him angry because you know? <laughs> if he curses you then that's the worst thing. <laughs> Brahmin's curse can be quite devastating. <laughs> That's another example, yeah. So their word is like their life, you know. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you, Hare Krishna. I think we, were, we ran out of time, yes? Should we, should we stop? It's, well, let's see, let's see if there's any more questions or comments. If not, then we can conclude. Anyone else? <laughs> oh, we got Raj here. Okay. Hare Krishna. Please accept my humble obeisances, Maharaj. All glories to Srila Prabhupada. All glories to all the Vaishnavas. Maharaj, when... Ram and Lakshman were out defeating the demons. The demons were easily recognizable. <laughs> In the current age, how can we recognize you can't. the demons? <laughs> you can't. Prabhupada said they, had, they have their suit and tie and you can't tell the difference. <laughs> but when they speak and when they act, then, you can, then something recognizable is there. <laughs> mm. Mm. Prabhupada said in 1972, and you can hear it on the tape, he said, the demons are only increasing. He said, as time goes on, they will become more and more and more. <laughs> and so, so we, have, we have to put our trust where trust can be, you know, not destroyed. We put our trust in the devotees. We put our trust in the saintly persons. When you're dealing with the outside people, you have to deal according to the rules and regulations of society. But then you have to see how much trust you can give. <laughs> And you should know, before you put trust in anyone or in any situation, you should know clearly what the situation is or a little bit enough about that person to give your trust. Yeah. And a trustworthy person has to be somewhat shown that they're trustworthy before you can actually trust them. So that requires a little bit of time to understand him. Huh? 
you know, you go to a shop and you buy some merchandise and you, you see the merchandise and you consider, yeah, the merchandise must be, it must be good, must be operable. Because it's being put on display and it's obviously it's there to be sold. It has to go through certain requirements in order to get to the point. But you find sometimes that doesn't, that's not the case. <laughs> It's just the way it is sometimes. So a little in time for investigation, inquiry, understanding. But still, we trust. <laughs> sometimes without understanding fully. This is the way life is. Just like you get on an airplane, how much do you know about the pilot? <laughs> but he's the one that's got your life in, his, in, your, in your hands, right? <laughs> you trust that he's qualified, he's authorized. Life things means to take a chance sometimes, just the way it is. But the problem is when people, their trust is breached or they have a bad experience, they have a tendency to start to distrust them. And that's bad because if you have that experience in the secular world and then you take that distrust mood into Vaishnav circles or spiritual circles, it impairs your progress in spiritual life because a whole mood of devotional life devotional culture is based on love and trust. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Once trust is breached, it's hard to rebuild it. Mm -hmm. But what can you do? This is, we have to sometimes take a chance. It's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Maharaj. Um, I think we will uh, adjourn for today for this discussion. Uh, just so you know, Marge, he gives, um, as mentioned at the beginning, he's um, done a lot of work in trying to um, give Krishna consciousness in different spheres of life. One of Maharaj's um, areas of focus has been actually um, helping prisoners um, you know in in countries um, in their situation and how to actually access a and actually develop a spiritual foundation in the circumstances that they live in so in that note Maharaj actually has released a book called Holy Jail so after this uh, session uh, these books are available for you to look at to purchase there's three books actually that Ma just got. One is uh, Holy Jail, and what are the other two? Are huh? oh, Forbidden Voices and that's it. Forbidden Voices and Daily Nectar. So Holy Jail, Forbidden Voices, and Daily Nectar. These are books by Marge on Krishna consciousness, but in a very kind of like modern, yeah, practically two applicable. Of, two of them are about jails, and the other one is just general principles of. Morality and spirituality. Okay. So two books are about the whole experience of Krishna consciousness in a jail setting and the others on, on overall ethics, morality. Um, so please do check them out. And so outside in the courtyard, we've got a school of bhakti table where you can actually have a look at the books and purchase them. And of course, um, as mentioned at the beginning, we have our school of bhakti courses, events, retreats going on throughout the year. So please have a look. In fact, our next retreat is next week uh, to France uh, with Chandramali Maharaj and some other keynote speakers. We've got another retreat coming up in August in our center in Lincoln. And then Kartik time, we've got a retreat to India, to Mayapur Jagannath Puri. And every month we've got lots of courses, different leveled courses so that for everyone to kind of like delve deeper into their spiritual life and understand what this Krishna consciousness is about. So in true manner tradition, 
in honor of Maharaj who has given his valuable time to take to talk about Lord Ram, can we please give three loud Hari Bols? Hari Bol! Hari Bol! Hari Bol! His Holiness Chandamuli Swami Maharaj Ki! Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. Please um, show your appreciation with a round of applause to the wonderful Ms. Kinchana Chaitanya Prabhu and of course His Holiness Chandramali Maharaj. Thank you very much for your time today um, and thank you for staying a little bit extended from beyond the time. That was very much appreciated. I think the audience definitely appreciated it. You were all very captive, a captive audience. Um, there's also the School of Bhakti website, which is www.schoolofbhakti.com. Very easy, schoolofbhakti.com. And Maharaj, do you have your website? Is there a website that we can yeah. reach you via? Uh, CM Swami uh, uh, dot com. Com. <laughs> CM Swami dot com. And I believe you have a contact form on that website if people want to write messages or uh, contact you via that way. So thank you very much. I know you've got more on your schedule now, a busy, busy schedule, so I'll leave you to, yeah. leave you to it. Thank you. Once again, a big round of applause to our honoured guests.